Welcome back, Apology, 8th grade, um, Physical Science Week 23, Day 1, textbook pages 382 to 388, notebook pages 318 to 320. The Human Eye. The most elegant application of a converging lens in all of God's creation can be seen in the eye. So peek at this figure. In simple terms, the eye contains several different optical elements that all work together to produce vision. The eye is covered by a thin, transparent substance called the cornea. It protects the eye from abrasions and the like. It also participates in the focusing of light by refracting light that enters the eye. The iris is a cover that can open up wide or close down to just a small hole. This regulates how much light gets into the eye. The opening left by the iris is called the pupil. When you are in the presence of bright light, the iris closes down to allow only a small amount of light into the eye. This makes your pu pupil small. When there is little light, the iris opens wide, allowing a larger percentage of light in. This makes your pupil look large. Once light enters the pupil, it is focused by a converging lens. The light is focused on the retina, which is made up of light-sensitive cells called rods and cones. When these cells sense light hitting them, they send electrical messages down the optic nerve to the brain, which decodes the messages and forms them into images. Now here's the really neat thing about the way the eye handles light. Have you ever watched a photographer focus their camera? The focus works by moving a converging lens back and forth inside a tube. As the converging lens moves, the point at which the light rays converge moves. A photographer moves the lens of their camera back and forth until the light rays converge so as to put the image right on the film of the camera. That results in a sharp, in-focus image on the film. If the object moves in relation to the lens, the image will form someplace else. And as a result, the lens must be moved again in order to get the light rays to converge at just the right place. Just as the camera must focus images on its film in order to take a picture, your eye must focus, focus images on its retina in order for you to see the image clearly. The retina has light sensitive cells that receive light and send signals to the brain based on the nature of that light. This allows your brain to form the image you see. If you see, if you are to see an image clearly then, it must be focused on your eye's retina. So how does your eye focus the light to your retina? Believe it or not, the eye can actually change the shape of the lens in order to keep the image in the same place, regardless of where the object is. This is accomplished with the ciliary muscle. It squeezes or expands the lens, which changes the lens's focal point. When the lens is squeezed down so that it is small and fat, the focal point is close to the lens. Thus, when an object moves in relation to the eye, the ciliary muscle changes the shape of the lens, which in turn changes the focal point of the lens to compensate. This keeps the image focused on the retina. This is an amazing feat of physics. To give you some idea of just how amazing this is, think about modern day cameras. Technology has given us very sophisticated uh, cameras. In fact, it is common now for even the cameras on smartphones to have autofocus. The camera can automatically adjust the position of the lens so that the image stays in the focus on the film. Even the most sophisticated camera, however, is still significantly slower in its autofocus capability as compared to our eye, and the image's focus is slightly less, uh, significantly less resolved. Part of the reason for this is the difference between the way a camera focuses and the way your eye focuses. Remember, a camera focuses by moving the lens. The eye, on the other hand, changes the very shape of the lens in order to change how the light rays focus. Moving a lens in order to change where the lights converge is not nearly as fast or as accurate as changing the shape of the lens. 
Unfortunately, cameras cannot use the faster, more accurate technique because human science cannot make a lens as sophisticated as that which you find in the eye. Thus, even the best that today's science has to offer cannot come close to mimicking the marvelous design of the eye. Even the best of designs, however, can have problems, sometimes due to flaws in genetics or due to overuse under the wrong types of circumstances, an eye can develop myopia, or nearsightedness, or hyperopia, which is farsightedness. These conditions develop when the eye's lens cannot be adjusted enough to make sure the image stays focused on the retina. For example, if you are nearsighted, your eye can use its ciliary muscle to change the lens enough to keep the image of objects close to you focused on the retina. However, as the object moves farther and farther away, the lens's focal point cannot be changed enough to keep the image there. As a result, the image gets blurry because the light is focused in front of the retina, not on the retina. To compensate for this, corrective lenses are, in, are placed in front of the eye. Because light is being refracted too strongly and thus focuses in front of the retina, diverging lenses are used. A diverging lens, such as the one shown in figure 10.39, refracts light rays so that they diverge from one another. This compensates for the fact that the eye refracts light too strongly and the result is an image that can be focused on the retina. A similar situation happens when a person is farsighted. In this case, the eye's lens can adjust to objects far away, but it cannot focus on objects that are close. As a result, corrective lenses are, use it, are used. As you might imagine, since nearsightedness is caused by the eye refracting light too strongly, farsightedness is caused by the eye refracting light too weakly. As a result, a converging lens must be used to correct farsightedness as it helps refract the light in the right direction before the light hits the eye. This makes up for the fact that the eye cannot refract light strongly enough on its own. All right, so quickly, myopia is nearsightedness. It's when you're unable to see things clearly unless they are relatively close to the eye. Hyperopia is farsightedness. It's the condition in which you can see distant objects clearly, but objects nearby may be blurry. How we perceive color. All right, experiment 10.4, how the eye detects color we will do in class, but let's at least um, cover it in the text. You can come back after we've done the experiment to help understand it better. Another remarkable aspect of the eye is how it perceives color. To get an idea of this marvelous process, how this marvelous process works, perform the following experiment. Again, that's um, experiment 10.4. What happened in the experiment? Most people will have seen a blue-green cross appear for a few moments on the blank sheet of paper. After a while, it should have vanished, however. This optical illusion will not work for some people, especially if they have a tendency toward color blindness. Now let's discuss why this illusion occurred. In order to see light, the retina of each eye is equipped with cells called rods and cones. The, the cone cells are sensitive to color while the rod cells are not. The cone cells transmit electrical signals to the brain when they are hit by certain frequencies of light. The brain receives the electrical transmissions and uses them to form an image in your mind. It turns out that some cone cells are sensitive only to low frequency visible light, red light, while others are sensitive to medium frequency visible light, green light, while still others are sensitive to higher frequency light, blue light. When colored light hits these cells, they will only send signals to the brain if the light that they are sensitive to is hitting them. Thus, if a mixture of blue and yellow light hits your eyes, the medium and high frequency cone cells transmit signals to your brain, but the low frequency cone cells do not. 
This is how your brain knows to construct an image in your mind that contains yellow and blue. In the experiment, while you were looking at the red cross, all of your low frequency cone cells sensing light from the cross were sending signals to the brain, but the other cone cells receiving light from the cross weren't doing anything. It turns out that cone cells get tired pretty quickly, and when they have sent the same signal to the brain for a period of several seconds, they eventually just shut off. The brain, sensing that no more signals are coming from the cone cells, assume that they have shut off simply because they are tired, and it holds the same image in your mind until new signals come along. Thus, as you were staring at the cross, the low-frequency cone cells receiving light from the cross eventually shut off. Since no more signals were coming from those low-frequency low cone cells, and since no new signals had come from the corresponding medium and high-frequency cone cells, the brain was receiving no more signals. It therefore assumed you were still looking at the cross and continued to hold the image in your mind. When you yank the top sheet away, white light began to hit your cone cells where only red light had hit them before. Since white light contains all frequencies, your medium and high frequency cone cells began to receive light and began to transmit signals to your brain. Your low frequency cone cells, however, were still shut off, so they didn't send any signals, even though they really should have. The brain started receiving new signals, but only from the medium and high frequency cone cells. So it constructed an image of green, medium frequency, and blue, high frequency light. Eventually, however, your low frequency cone cells recuperated from their fatigue and began transmitting again. Once they did, the brain realized that the eyes were seeing all frequencies of light and thus formed a white image in your mind. Therefore, the way we perceive color is based on the frequency of the light that hits our eyes. Isn't it awesome how the eye is designed to handle such complex operations? Adding and subtracting colors. Your eyes can discern more than 16 million different colors. However, they only need three types of cone cells to do so. With cone cells that are sensitive to only three basic colors, red, green, and blue, your mind can construct a myriad of colors. Why? Well, these different, um, these three colors are called the additive primary colors because they can be added together in different proportions to produce virtually any color. All right, so peek at um, figure 10.43, red, blue, and green are the additive primary colors of light. When they are all mixed together, it actually makes white. On the left-hand side of the figure, you see what happens when the three additive primary colors of light are mixed. Equal parts of red and green, for example, make yellow. Equal parts of blue and green make the color cyan. And equal parts of blue and red make the color magenta. Finally, equal amounts of all three colors of light results in white light. If we vary the amounts of the primary colors, the colors change. The right side of the figure, for example, shows you a few of the colors you can get when you add primary colors of light in unequal amounts. This is how a color television or a computer screen makes colors. These screens produce only the three additive primary colors, RGB or red, green, and blue. By adding those three colors in different varying amounts, they can actually produce more than 16 million different colors. Primary colors of pigment. Although all this makes sense, have you ever tried actually mixing red and green paints or food color? If you have, the result was certainly not yellow. It was probably mostly black. If red light and green light add to make yellow light, why don't red paint and green paint add to make yellow paint? The reason is that paints and dyes produce color in a very different way from how color televisions and computer monitors produce it. Remember, computer monitors and color televisions shine light in your eyes. That's why you can see these devices even when the lights are not on in the room. 
If you were to paint a picture and turn the lights off, however, you would no longer see the picture. That's because the picture does not shine light in your eyes. Instead, white light from the sun or from a light bulb reflects off of the picture and hits your eyes. Thus, while televisions and computer monitors generate light that shines into your eyes, paints and dyes reflect light into your eyes. This makes a dramatic difference in how colors are generated. Red paint, for example, is red because when light strikes it, the chemical in paint absorbs all wavelengths of light except those which correspond to the color red. White light hits the paint, but the only light we see reflected off the paint is red light. Thus, we see the color as red. Green paint, on the other hand, absorbs all visible wavelengths except those that correspond to the color green. Thus, when white light hits green paint, only green light wavelengths reflect off it. As a result, we see the color as green because only green light reaches our eyes. What happens then when you mix green paint and red paint? Well, the red paint absorbs all colors of light except red and the green paint absorbs all colors except green. Between the two paints then, all visible wavelengths are absorbed. As a result, virtually no light gets reflected and the apparent color is black, which is the absence of light. Is there a way of mixing paints and dyes in order to come up with different colors? Yes, of course. But instead of mixing, instead of using red, green, and blue, we mix the subtractive primary colors, which are cyan, magenta, and yellow. These colors are known as the primary colors of pigments, and these are shown in the figure 10.44. These colors mix so as not to absorb all wavelengths of light. Cyan, for example, absorbs all visible wavelengths except those that correspond to blue and green. Yellow, on the other hand, absorbs all visible wavelengths except those that correspond to red and green. When yellow and cyan mix, then all visible wavelengths are absorbed except green. Thus, a mixture of yellow and cyan produces green. The pictures of this book were made using the primary colors of pigment. If you were to look at any of the pictures in this book under a microscope, you would actually see dots of cyan and magenta, yellow and black, CMYK. When this book was printed, only those four inks were used. Depending on how those inks were placed on the paper, However, different colors of light get reflected off the page, resulting in all the colors you see in the book. Finish up by answering the last two on your own of module 10. On your own 10.12. Suppose you have two flashlights, you cover the first with green cellophane and shine it on a mirror. When you look at the mirror, you see a green spot of light. If you were to then take the second flashlight Cover it with red cellophane and shine it on the same part of the mirror on which the green spot is still shining. What color would you see? The mirror reflects all wavelengths that hit it. When the green hits it, it will reflect green. When the red hits it, it will reflect red. When both hit it, it will reflect both. When your eyes see both colors, your brain will add them together to make yellow. So here we go, red on top of green, make yellow. They added together the primary colors of light. On your own 1013, suppose you took a red shirt and put it in a dark room. Then suppose you took a flashlight and covered it with green cellophane as described above. If you were to go into the dark room and shine the green cellophane covered flashlight on the red shirt, what color would you see? Assume the dye on the shirt uses the subtractive primary colors to make its light. Okay. The red shirt is red because when light strikes it, it absorbs all other wavelengths except red. It does this by mixing yellow and magenta. The yellow absorbs all wavelengths except red and green, and the magenta absorbs all wavelengths except red and blue. Thus, red is the only wavelength reflected from the shirt. 
When the green light shines on it, the green light will be absorbed by the magenta. Nothing will be reflected back. Thus, the shirt will look black. In fact, it won't even look like a shirt. Without any light reflecting back from it, you will not even see the shirt.